Can you hear me? God, you so can. Um, for those Check. of you I don't know, um, my name is Scott Maley. I'm the chair of the theater department. I'm super psyched to be here. This is uh, being live streamed by HowlRound through Arts Emerson. So this is actually going to be available to other people, which I'm super, super excited about. Um, so what I'd like to do is start off by introducing our guest. We're going to have a little bit of a chat. And then at the end, we'll save some time so that you guys can ask some questions. Um, so if you're students, that gives you time to start thinking right now. Um, if you're faculty and you didn't have questions prepared, like, look at your choices. Um, <laughs> so uh, our guest today, Taylor Mack, who uses Judy, like just like a regular pronoun, not as a name, but as a gender pronoun, is a playwright, actor, singer-songwriter, performance artist, director, and producer. Judy's work has been performed in hundreds of venues, including on Broadway and in New York's Town Hall Lincoln Center, Celebrate Brooklyn, and Playwrights Horizon, as well as London's Hackney Empire and Barbican, DC's Kennedy Center, Los Angeles' Royce Center, and Ace Theater through the Center of the Art of Performance, <laughs> Chicago Steppenwolf Theater, and the Sydney Opera House, the Melbourne Festival Forum Theater, Stockholm Sodra Teatern, and the Spoleto Festival, and San Francisco's Curran Theater and MoMA. Judy is the author of many works of theater, including Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus, a 24-decade history of popular music, which we'll see a bit of tomorrow night. Uh, Holiday Sauce, Here, The Walk Across America from Mother Earth, Comparison is Violence, The Lily's Revenge, The Young Ladies of, Red Tide Blooming, The Beast of Taylor Mac, <laughs> Cardiac Arrest, or Venus on a Half Clam, The Face of Liberalism, OK, Maurizio Pellini, A Crevice, <laughs> and The Hot Month, and the soon to be premiered plays, Prosperous Fools, and The Fray. Sometimes Taylor acts in other people's plays or co-creations, notably Shen Te Shui Ta and the Foundry Theater's production of The Good Person, Person of Sichuan, at La Mama and the Public Theater and the City Center's Encore's production of Gone Missing, Puck Aegeus in the classic stage companies of Midsummer Night's Dream and in the two-man vaudeville The Last Two People on Earth, opposite Mandy Patinkin and directed by Susan Stroman. Mac is a MacArthur Fellow, a Pulitzer Prize finalist for drama, a Tony-nominated playwright, and the recipient of multiple awards, including the Kennedy Prize, a New York Drama Critics Circle Award, a Doris Duke Performing Arts Award, a Guggenheim, the Herb Alpert in Theater, the Peter Zeisler Memorial Award, the Helen Merrill Playwriting Award, two Bessies, two Obies, a Helpman, and an Ethel Eichelberger Award. <laughs> an alumnus of New Dramatist Duty is currently a New York Theater Workshop usual suspect and the resident playwright at the Here Arts Center. Please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to the divine and very patient Taylor Mack. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> that's so funny because I think that's on my website, you know. Allegedly. And normally you wouldn't, uh, for a bio, you, you know, just say a few things and that's all you say. Uh, but as a queer person, you, you're trained to just like um, promote yourself nonstop because <laughs> no one else will do it for you. But now I'm at this place where I'm like, oh, I should tone that down a bit. <laughs> I'm glad we could start off by embarrassing you. That's great. Um, so since it comes up right at the beginning uh, at, of your bio, could you explain particularly for our students a little bit about the pronoun Judy? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I, 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 I call this my relative man drag. Uh, I, um, I perform, you'll see if you come to the show uh, tomorrow night, uh, I, I perform in, I guess, what some people would call drag. Uh, it's not really female impersonation drag, it's something else, a gender queer drag, if you will. Um, I, I say my gender isn't male or female, my gender is performer. And um, uh, I, I would perform on stage and people would introduce me as he and then they would introduce me as she and it never felt right and I thought, you know, I'm a queer person and I'm a creative so why don't I make my pronoun an art project? And uh, so I chose the pronoun Judy because uh, for a number of reasons, um, I wanted people to pause and have to think about pronouns and gender and all that kind of stuff. Also because of the lineage of Judy. And, uh, and but Punch and Judy as well, and Judy Garland, and, um, and, Judy. and <laughs> not Judge Judy, no. Uh, but also um, uh, gay men, uh, 
before every, most people were out, um, used to call their boyfriends uh, Mary or Judy uh, when they were talking about them in public so people would think it was their girlfriend they were talking about. So I like that kind of lineage to it. And then the other reason is that people tend to judge uh, gender pronouns when you have one that's not uh, part of the binary. And uh, so I thought, and they tend to roll their eyes. And I thought, well, I want to uh, choose a pronoun that will immediately emasculate you if you judge it. So, because you can't roll your eyes and say Judy at the same time without being camp. So that's um, those are my. That was why I, why I chose Judy. Great. <laughs> um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, drag your work being drag adjacent or not traditional drag. I mean, I think a lot of people when they, if they're not super familiar with drag, they think of like RuPaul's Drag Race and female mm. impersonation. Yeah. So how did your own drag work develop since I get, obviously that's a big part of the, the history of it, but not necessarily your particular aesthetic? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'd always seen drag queens, um, I mean, I moved to San Francisco when I was 17, no, uh, yeah, 17. Uh, and so I'd seen drag queens around, um, and uh, but I never really related to them because the ones that I'd seen in terms of the art form, um, it was a lot of lip syncing and um, vagina jokes, and that was not something that I wanted my art form to be. So uh, I, I just didn't think it was for me, and then I learned um, that it's like all art forms, it's varied. Um, there's all many, there's so many different kinds. Um, it's like saying, I don't like realism. Well, I mean, there's so many different kinds of realism, you know, so uh, how do you know if you don't like it? Um, just explore a little bit, you know, or, or even more than that, it's like saying, I don't like dance. Well, okay, well, there's lots of <laughs> dance, you know. So, uh, so I, I, then I started getting a little access to uh, some other uh, types of performers and I found it very inspiring and I, um, and I found it, that it was connected to a, a thing I was I was longing for, which uh, it was connected to a, a Greek performance, which was they would wear platform high heel shoes and they had big arm extensions and and uh, they didn't have makeup but they had masks that were that was like makeup and the masks were shaped um, so that their voices would go out farther and they would so it's like a microphone and um so it just felt and there was heightened language and i just thought that that's that's the tradition of performance that i i wanted to work in and and i was trained in um greeks and elizabethans and and commedia and so commedia is in there as well and um and i think i i ultimately just i wanted to be a, an elizabethan fool more than anything else so this was my way of fi finding my way to that that's great so you mentioned some of the, the people you were exposed to. Were there um, certain artists that you were looking at uh, growing up or either as a young person who, who really sort of inspired you or? Um um, as a young person, I can't say. I mean, I grew up in Stockton, California. We didn't have culture. Um, we had Hollywood movies. Uh, and um, we had, at that point, three or plus PBS, so four uh, TV stations. Um, and PBS only had, um, you know, news as a kid. You, d you didn't want to watch news or it had Peter, Paul and Mary, you know, fundraising. So, um, you know, <laughs> which I liked. I, I liked Peter, Paul and Mary, but, you know, how many times can you watch Peter, Paul and Mary? So it was like Cheers, you know, was considered culture. Um, uh, and so I, I can't say that as a young person I, I did. I didn't really know anything about um anybody i guess i would you know in in terms of hollywood you're drawn to people like Bette midler and it's the usual gay icons you know like <laughs> judy garland Bette midler <laughs> like there you go <laughs> those are my girls <laughs> but um but then as i got older uh i got exposed to a, a, a playwright uh composer by the name of elizabeth suedos who um uh was the first time I uh, I discovered s that um, theater could be something other than just entertainment, that it um, it could uh, grapple issues and and um, uh, inspire you to dive into the ideas and the problems of our times and um, and so that that was a, a an a, an eye opener at, at a youngish age and then when I came to New York City most of the 
people who would have passed the torch down, um, like the Ethel Eich- Eichelberger, Charles Ludlam, and all that kind of stuff, they had um, passed away from AIDS uh, just as I had moved to New York City. So there, I, it took me a while to find a uh, community and find the um, the people that you know I could. I, I kind of felt like I had to invent it from scratch, but. Um, but meanwhile, I wasn't inventing it from scratch. I was um, pulling from people who had pulled from those people. So uh, uh, there was uh, Mabu Mines and people like that, you know, that I was watching their work, and and, and that was uh, fascinating. And it, again, it just opened up my brain. And um, yeah. You mentioned actually, um, you know, being a, a young person in the city at the height of the AIDS crisis. And whenever we talk about this to our students, to them it's very different from them. It's history and they, I don't think that they necessarily view HIV in the same way. So what's it like to be a young queer person coming of age, you know, again, also finding yourself as an artist at the height of that particular crisis? Um, it was, uh, it was tough. Uh, the, um, Homosexuality was a, a national conversation because um, uh, because of AIDS, uh, because the ACT UP activists had made it a national conversation. Um, the government was choosing to ignore it and had turned it into an epidemic. And um, because it was only uh, only queer people and um, only gay men and um, IV drug users uh, primarily and sex workers were being affected by it. So the, um, the Reagan, uh, Reagan administration didn't want to even mention those people, so um, didn't do anything about it. Um, so people were, thousands of people were dying and, uh, um, and everybody was, uh, homophobia was really, really um, intense at the time. Um, because everybody thought that if, you know, you were a queer kid, you would give them AIDS. You know, people thought I'd never had sex and I wasn't a hemophiliac, so I wasn't going to give anyone AIDS. But everyone, all the kids in school thought I was going to give them AIDS. So you would get beat up all the time and you would, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you have to think of it like uh, if every single person that you know, um, if you basically think about all the people in your life and um, they're all dead. You know, so I I have uh, older friends who you know a um, hundred people that they know died within the course of a few years, um, so that's traumatic in a way, and it and it frames uh, how you think about uh, sex certainly, and um, and what happened was all the radicals, uh, all the radical queers were having radical sex, so they were the ones um, who died, they were the ones who were progressing our culture forward, and they died, all the big thinkers and the creatives, and so then, um, what, and then what, what we found was that the heterosexuals who were in charge of the media would then um, hire the gays that they felt comfortable to talk for the gay community. So we had all these radical leaders and then suddenly we had all these very conservative leaders who were advocating for gay marriage and gays in the military when that was never the agenda, of the queer agenda before that. So it really, um, uh, Sarah um, Shulman calls it the gentrification of the mind. It, it kind of transformed the queer uh, movement in a way and the queer community. So it was, it was, it it's it wasn't a a great time. On the flip side of that, um, the community was being torn apart, and it was building itself at, at because it was being torn apart. So the activism that Larry Kramer and the ACT UP people did, and Queer Nation um, that they were doing, and the Lesbian Avengers, uh, in terms of visibility, was uh, unheard of, and um, and has changed the world. So that is uh, something that's I'm eternally grateful for. Um. So, can you remember the first time you performed drag in a club or a bar, or what that experience was like? Oh, oh I was in Provincetown. Uh, the first time I, per- I mean, I've done drag a few times, but the first time I performed in a bar uh, or a cl- uh, like a club show was in this show called Showgirls in Provincetown with Ryan Landry was the host, <laughs> and uh, my my boyfriend at the time dressed me up, and I went and I sang a song and won a hundred bucks and. And there, and the rest was history. <laughs> um, so.
So I have a, I'm going to try not to do this to you too much, but I have a couple of quotes from you. Um, one is, you said you can't really be an artist and not embrace failure. Um, and that's certainly something for our students that we really try to get across to them, that it's okay to fail. It's okay to not know what you're going to do next. And <laughs> I think particularly in a performance setting, that's got to be a, a serious tightrope act. So uh, can you speak to experiences you had where you, you act actively experienced failure, but you did feel like you came out the other side of it? I mean, uh, every single time I perform, uh, you'll see. I'm going to fail tomorrow night. You'll, you'll see me. We'll figure our way through it. You know, it happens every single time. Um, uh, the, uh, I, well, I could tell a story about where I realized that perfection wasn't as good sometimes as authentic failure, which is uh, performing in a club. And uh, I gotten up and I sang a song. It was another one of these competition things, which, you know, I blame my drag mother, Mother Flawless Sabrina. She created the drag competitions across the U.S. in the late 50s. And, uh, and so now the drag queens always have to compete for each other. But um, we were, we were, I was trying to pay my rent, you know, and it was a hundred dollar prize at the Splash Bar, which is a bar I would never go to in New York City. But I was like, I dressed up. I went to that Splash Bar in desperation so I could pay my rent and uh and i sang a song and i my voice was great and it, you know i gave the a really uh, like um uh objectively fantastic performance and the audience was like yeah yeah okay 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 <laughs> and uh then a queen got up and she's uh lip-synced very badly to that song my pussy and yeah, my crack you know that I know. and um can I say that in the church? Uh, but she lip synced badly to it, and then she took out her teeth. She had two teeth. She took out her falsies, and at the end, she went, mm. and the audience went crazy, and I went crazy. We were all screaming and cheering for her, and it was a moment uh, where I realized, my little epiphany moment, where I realized that uh, authentic failure, exposing uh, your vulnerability, uh, and your humanity is sometimes better than polish and craft and uh, uh, that it could ever be. I choose to try to uh, put myself in a situation where I can do both. I use my virtuosity and I, I, I set myself up in a situation where I, I, like perfection is ridiculous. We were just joking today that, you know, our show is, um, we try to make our shows so big they will fail, you know, um, as, and so um, that's that's kind of o always the goal. Twenty four decade history. It was a twenty four hour concert, and there was no way we I could do that perfectly. It was two hundred forty six songs and memorize them. It was all this um, dialogue that I have and uh, uh, sleep deprivation, and there's no way I could do it perfectly. My voice is going to crack, but that's part of the art of it, and part of the joy and fun is to figure out what you can do when the calamity comes in. In, into the performance, how you can transform it and, and focus everybody's attention on the transformation of a calamity as art. You know. And in performance, how much of what you do changes? I mean, I know you, you, you'll have a set song list, right? And obviously there's certain, like, sort of, I don't want to say dialogue or monologue sections that you want to include, but since some of it is so interactive, how much of it changes from night to night or even from tour to tour, if you will? Uh, probably like 20%. Yeah, uh, I mean the songs basically are the same. Sometimes I'll say, "Hey Matt, let's sing this different song tonight," and maybe we'll have rehearsed it recently, and maybe everyone will be like, "Okay, we'll try it," uh, and we find our way through. Um, usually, we perform with guest performers too, so that's always a new element. Um, uh, everywhere we go, we like to perform with somebody local, um, bring somebody local into the show. Uh, um, and then, you know, it depends on what's happening in the news, what's happening with the weather, what's happening, what time the show is, what the venue's like, um, uh, uh, you know, it, all of that thing. What what was um, happening right before the show happened? Well, last night there was this whole f um, parade in Providence of fire in the river kind of thing. Uh, you know, so everyone was kind of jazzed to be outside and seeing this in. And then they all came in and there was all this big energy. So I felt like, oh, great. I, uh, we can start the show off big and celebrate. But, you know, maybe who knows what will happen tomorrow night. But uh, I imagine it will be a little more subdued. And we can that something on fire before. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that could happen. Uh, 
I imagine that at a uh, you know at the Holy Cross um, that uh, the the even though it's Catholic the Puritan dominance over expression uh, might be present in Rhode Island, and so uh, that it might be subdued. So we might have to warm everybody up a little bit more, and and then we'll just change the show in order to do it that way. You know. And when you're developing, uh, but I can't say that. I could walk out and everyone's like, yeah. You know, yeah, you never know, and it's and it's really bad to prejudge because then you start to you start to make your plan about how it's going to be, and then you're not open to the present moment. So. so, how do you? What is your process for developing a performance piece like this? I mean, whether it's two or three hours, let alone twenty-four, how do you begin developing it? Uh, we we worked a, a very uh, um. In hindsight, it was more like a no theater process where everybody learns their own part separately and then we get together and we just do it in front of the audience. So we would not really rehearse ever. Um, we would do a, if it was a three hour show, we would rehearse with the band for three hours just to make sure the charts were um, the right form. And then, but what we would do is we would perform it, perform it, perform it, perform it, perform it over and over and over again. And then after each performance, we would talk about what worked, what didn't work. And then we would just change it the next performance. And that's including the costume. Uh, my costume designer would show up um, the day of the show with the outfit and sometimes five minutes before I go on uh, I put it on for the first time um, sometimes on stage he'll come out with something that he just made and put it on me um, so it's it's very spontaneous in that way and uh, I it, it's it, there's a liveness to it that um, is bigger than most of the theater that is pretending to be live, but is really just kind of, you know, hitting the marks and and they call it freezing the show on Broadway. That's what they say. Is the show frozen? Is the show frozen? You're like, <laughs> ew, you know. Um, <laughs> stop that. Uh, they want it to be exactly the same every night, and I just find that why then go make a movie. So <laughs> I, I, I was started thinking about the musical Frozen. I got a little bit up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how is that process different than when you work as a playwright? Um, well, it's not. S I mean, it wouldn't have to be different. Uh, I certainly know Penny Arcade, a, a mentor of mine. Um, uh, she said to me that she never uh, writes her plays. You know, she does these. Um, primarily, she does solo shows. I, I don't. She wouldn't call them solo shows, probably, but um, where she, she does these monologue shows, and uh, she says, "I don't write it down. I just perform it, and then I hone it, hone it, hone it, hone it, hone it, and eventually I have a show." And uh, I, I'm a little bit of both, you know. Uh, so with a play like The Lily's Revenge, which is a five-hour play that I wrote, I wrote the five-hour play, and we would perform it, but then. Every night, I would say, uh, you know, I think that, that that line's not working. It didn't work last night. Let me try something different tonight, and I'd change it. Or I might tell somebody in the cast, hey, say this, like right before we go on stage. You know, say this instead. And so we can change it that way. Um, uh, some, for something like here, my play here, uh, which I'm not in, didn't write a part for myself, I would um, basically, ex I expect the dialogue to be what I've written, but I create moments in the play that are clearly <coughs> clearly um, things that each production is going to be able to create new and that hopefully every night they're able to do um, new. So things like the puppet show in here has never been the same by any company that's ever done it. There's been something like 70 productions and they're all so different, you know. Um, so those kinds of things I really enjoy doing, putting into the plays. Yeah. Um, you've described yourself as a maximalist, which I think is a nice counterpoint to minimalism. So could you tell us a little bit about what that means? Well, I mean, what, what I love about maximalism is that minimalism is in it. So minimalism does not have maximalism in it. So 
So I prefer, you know, I what well, I'm an artist. I, what I like is I'm interested in heterogeneity. I grew up in the suburbs of, I mean, I grew up in Stockton where it felt like a suburb, and it. Uh, Everyone was expected to be the same, but nobody was. It created a lot of tension, a lot of economic disparity, a lot of racism, a lot of homophobia, sexism, all that stuff, um, because everyone was supposed to adhere to a certain kind of American whiteness, you know. And uh, and that just didn't work. Uh, it was the one of the more violent places in America growing up. It was you know had the one of the highest illiteracy rates in America growing up so it, it obviously didn't work so i i i thought yeah we the 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 goal isn't homogeneity the goal isn't to reduce ourselves down to one thing um uh one nation under one god uh the goal is to kind of expand ourselves and see um how 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 large w we can be, how expressive, how how multifaceted, how we don't know anything. I, I was just saying to some people earlier today, I'm more like Socrates in the sense that I, I, the only thing I know is that I don't know. And um, that's just a really good way to approach life, I think. <laughs> I think. I don't know, you know. <laughs> so... Um, uh, that's uh, I, my feeling is that it's the heterogeneity that I'm after more than anything, and so that's that's where the maximalism comes in because you know um, it, we could try a little of this, try a little of that, try a little of this, try a little of that. See, see, see when you take everything and you squish it all together, you make something new, and and that I find that very fascinating. But it, it doesn't mean you do that all at the same time. I mean, sometimes you do, but. Um, Sometimes you just go for the minimalism for five minutes. But if you have a two-hour show or a 24-hour show, you have time to do a lot, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. um, you've described the 24-decade history as a radical fairy realness ritual, yeah. which yeah. I want to get a tattoo of at some point. But <laughs> could you tell us uh, a little bit about what that means, especially because not everybody may be familiar with radical fairy. Aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah, the Radical Fairies are um, started um, by Harry Hay and a bunch of other um, uh, gay men at the time. Uh, and now it's everybody. It's um, lesbians, gays, transgender, uh, everybody, pansexual, whatever. Everybody's, you know, they anyway, everyone's welcome now. Um, but it's still primarily, I would say, primarily gay men. Um uh, th you could describe them as hippies. I, they they just were um, uh, queers who wanted to not define the way that they lived their life based on the status quo, based on heterosexual ways of being, and wanted to figure out is was there another way that they could live that was better for them. So it's a lot about um, Four hundred drag queens in the woods of rural Tennessee, you know, living in a commune, you know, <laughs> it's like that kind of thing. Yeah, and but it's also, um, I think the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is a group of um, drag queen nuns, came out of it that have do, do hospice work and great political work. Uh, um, uh, it's a lot of alternative thinking and um, radical consent. Uh, the reason that we're talking about consent right now is. Uh, uh, a lot because of the radical queers who've been working with radical consent for decades now. Um, so, uh, and that came uh, um, from these workshops that the radical fairies would do, and um, it came from other places as well, but you know, also there. And so, um, they're just wonderful, and I've been a part of the community kind of lightly uh, for 25 years, and was down at the commune, and um, and was really inspired by how they've incorporated ritual into their uh, uh, into their lives and their practice their practice ritual into the practice, and uh, and I was looking for a form for twenty four decade and I discovered what I what I wanted the form to be while I was there so I just wanted to honor them by acknowledging um, acknowledging that in the title. Yeah. And so is partly what you do in performance is it ritual? Is, does it have a ritual component? I mean, when we teach theater to our students. There's a lot of sort of points in history where we sort of see a very clear tying of ritual to performance. So is that sort of a goal in, in the piece? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. It was um, the piece, as I was saying, the piece was designed by 
performing, 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 performing. Perform. It was built that way. So there was a ritual aspect where people would come back and see, they'd see a decade that we had performed, then they'd come back and see another decade. So it, each decade is about an hour of performance, and there's 24 of them. So we, we worked on that show for six years before we put the entire thing together. Um, and so people would come back over and over and over again for six years. Usually in the theater, what you do is you make you take something tangible like a script and you make something ephemeral out of it, um, like a production. Um, and uh, in this process, it was more like we take something ephemeral, like performance, and we made something tangible out of it. Like people would meet each other at the shows, um, start businesses together, uh, create other art pieces together. Um, multiple babies have been, been born as a result of people meeting at the shows. I've been invited to weddings, that, you know, so, so it's... Um, it's uh, political movements have kind of like come up from people, not, I won't say political movements, but political groups have come up from people meeting, you know, so things have sprung up out of it that are, you can actually hold in your hand in a way that um, I think that is not um, a tchotchke, you know, uh, and uh, that's fascinating, I think, to, to think of that theater has that potential to do that. And I think usually it's ritual theater. And what we don't have a lot of in our lives are ritual anymore. We, uh, especially ritual that uh, is asking you to be multiple things instead of one thing. So we have the ritual of sporting events that asks you to root for one team. And we have the ritual of church that asks you to root for one God. But we don't have a lot of rituals that say, hey, we could be expansive. Um, and so that's the... Um, that's the hope that 24 Decade is helping to fill some of that gap. And when you're performing on stage, you talked earlier about the costumes and a new piece might come out and that's obviously gonna change how you perform. How close is the you on stage to who you are in real life? Is it an exaggerated version of yourself? Is it a complete character where you feel like whatever is happening in the performance sort of dictates who you are that night, or do you feel like it's an extension of yourself? Uh, I, I feel like it's what I look like on the inside, um, expressed uh, outwardly. When you're on stage, you're in a heightened circumstance, so it's really just me in a heightened circumstance. So my voice is louder, uh, my gestures are bigger, um, I'm trying to get to the back row, um, I'm, I'm certainly in a heightened circumstance of, of uh, grappling with the... the history of America, you know, all that history on our backs, what are we going to do with it? Um, uh, you know, so those are the types of things that uh, I just um, uh, think that my particular drag is. It's just me, but in a heightened circumstance. So I, uh, people will say, are you hiding under all that drag? And I say, no, 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 I'm, it's a reveal of who I am on the inside that I don't normally show. So this is my relative man drag. I would walk down the street in and people wouldn't really notice me. Uh, but my responsibility on a stage is to actually be brave and show something that I wouldn't I, I wouldn't normally show, not the thing that's going to make me look like everybody else and that I'll hide. So, um, so like, this is cam, I mean, relative camouflage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, what you're all wearing right now is camouflage because you could walk down the street and, and ev somebody else could be wearing the exact same thing. Well, maybe not that shirt right there, but, you know. So, so that's, that would, that's when, that's us hiding is when we're dressed like this. That's us hiding. But, um, you know, on stage, you show up. Yeah. And the the revisionist part of your description of 24 decade, revisionist history often gets a very sort of negative connotation, right? That whether it's people of color, people of non-Christian faiths, or LGBTQ people going back and quote unquote rewriting history or digging through history with an, an agenda, if you mm -hmm. will. So is a 24 decade in, ma in many ways is tackling uh, America just through a different lens. So is it in some ways, how can you correct that negative connotation of the idea of revising history where certain groups of people have been eliminated or overlooked or? Uh, I, I, uh, that's, yeah, that's not my approach. I'm not going in and inventing um, queerness in history where there probably wasn't or, you know, I mean, first off, I know I'm a queer, which means that there were queers hundreds of years ago. Abraham Lincoln. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. We know. We know this. We know this. But the historians won't uh, admit it because they're uptight. But um, 
Well, they are. Uh, you know, and they're a little homophobic, and they won't admit that either. But, um, but the my goal wasn't to do that. My goal was it's very rare for the uh, for uh, queer people or people of color um, to represent anything other than themselves in art or their their group, right? Um, a queer can represent other queers, but a queer cannot represent America. And so with a 24 decade, I said, well, I'm going to represent, I'm, the queer is going to be the metaphor for America. Uh, with my play here, the transgender child is going to be the metaphor for America instead of um, this other thing where we're always having to stretch, the queers are always having to stretch towards uh, the status quo and make the status quo stretch towards uh, see themselves in us. So, um, so the, uh, that's that's how I saw it with the history. Is it's it's I didn't have to say that the um, American Revolution was uh, queer. I just have to perform the American Revolution on stage, and I'm a queer body and a queer person, and suddenly it's queer. That's you know that's and that's the truth of our history as well. And then there are things that help a little bit along the way, like Yankee Doodle Dandy. Well, who was that dandy? <laughs> I mean, right? So. Um, and I know the history of like why why it got written and blah 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 blah, but uh, but the fact is that there was a dandy and there's lots of songs that make fun of dandies <laughs> throughout our history, which means they were there, <laughs> right? Um, I could ask you a lot more questions. I would like to open it up to our audience to see if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Taylor, and if you could speak nice and loud, otherwise I'll like Oprah style come at you with a microphone. Ah, how do I deal with negative criticism? I'll do that thing where I repeat the question so the people there can hear it. Um, uh, whew. It's a... Uh, um, I read uh, all of it, and but now I'm getting to a place where maybe I don't want to because it's turning into a different kind of criticism uh, because after you get a certain amount of success... The negative criticism is about, do you deserve that success? It's about trying to stop you from um, working instead of actually wondering about your art, right? Um, and it's very hard to know uh, where the agenda is um, from the negative criticism. So uh, I, I think I might be at a place where I'm like, I'm just going to stop reading criticism which is sad to me but uh it is a little bit of the state of the world and it just it's you know you just gotta bat it away 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 uh self-consciousness kills creativity so we have to put ourselves in a in a situation where we're, we can be as as unselfconscious as we possibly can and if anything is threatening to take the story away from the storyteller then you have to incorporate that threatening thing into the story. So if you get negative criticism, then you kind of you've got to figure out a way to bring that into the story. And I don't always want to do that, you know. So, um, but sometimes you can't avoid it, and then you just, you know, you just got to go. Okay, that the, the important thing to know is that most of the people who um, uh, want to tell you their opinion. Um, haven't really considered their opinion. And that's very helpful to just constantly remind yourself of that, that people like to decide and move on to the next thing. And um, my goal as an artist isn't to, I don't want people to like it or dislike it. I, I want them to perpetually consider it, perpetually consider the ideas. Um, so there's nothing more annoying to me than a review that is like, it was amazing. Okay, you know what was it? What did what did you think about? What did you do? What do you want to do in the world? Blah 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 blah. Like further the conversation that the artist is putting forth. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, but when people want to reduce it down to whether it worked or it didn't work, um, then it's just that person is invalid in my in my estimation. <laughs> so you can kind of dismiss them. Yeah, but it's you know easier said than done. Yeah. 
Oh. Uh, so when to let a project go? Well, with 24 Decade, I designed it as a 10-year uh, project because it has so, many, so much to do with decades in our history, so I wanted the project itself to last a decade. Um, so we've been working on it for nine years. We've got another year. We're going to Berlin to do the whole thing, and then we're going to um, hopefully bring the whole thing back to New York City and do it one last hurrah. Um, not in a 24-hour form, but in, you know... Um, the, the entire show in smaller uh, evening performances. And and then I'm kind of done with performing the entire thing. I think we'll probably do a bridge show is what we're going to do tomorrow night for a number of years after that. But, um, but I'm anxious for new you know so but i i worked that structure into into the performance of the piece and it's been just divine uh um with something like here uh my play or uh i um that i'm not in we did three productions uh and i felt like that was enough i i i uh I I learned uh, a lot about the play in those three productions. I did rewrites all through them, and then we we published it, and and it's out in the world. And maybe I'll revisit it, you know, in ten years, and and be involved in another production. But I prefer to let other people play with it, and and um, so I've kind of let that one go out into the world. Uh, with something like Gary, uh, which has only had one production so far on Broadway, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm I'm anxious to do more productions and and see what other people come up with it uh, and come up with it and actually t to um, well I won't go into that but uh, but I'm I'm looking forward to other other productions so i don't know how many more i would do but i guess i i guess the answer is you just kind of feel it out and you see what fe feels right in the american theater it's challenging because you have all this energy uh, adrenaline for a project uh you you want to finish it and then the american theater is so slow that like my play Prosperous Fools, I wrote it five years ago, and it's just now maybe going to get a production, but we're still not sure, you know. And so eventually I'm going to have to decide, do I produce it myself? Um, because I just can't get a theater to produce a play about that is critical of philanthropy because nobody wants to produce a play that is critical of philanthropy when they need philanthropists. So I might have to produce it myself, and that will mean another five years. So it might not get done for another five years. You know, it could be done in the next two years or not. Um, and you just, uh, I don't, it, it's hard because my heart always goes to the next project. Um, and once I write it, I'm, I'm moving on, you know, um, but you've got to, you've got to figure out a way to manage the back and forth. And I don't really have a strategy for it. I just, I can, one project at a time, but that might mean two weeks, one at a time for two weeks, I'm working on this project. And then the next two weeks I'm working on this one that I wrote five years ago, but I'm doing a new draft. And then, you know, in the next two weeks I'm learning a new song for the show. And, you know, it's just kind of constant juggling. And, uh, how do I find my collaborators? Um, I see work. Uh, I don't audition. I try not to audition. Uh, uh, sometimes I work with directors who audition. Um, I ask them not to audition. Sometimes they agree with me. Sometimes they don't. Um, I don't like to audition. I don't. I don't want to do it. I just want to go and see work and find people that I find fascinating. Uh, I just want to meet people and I just want to play with people. You know, um, I want to make work and see if it works out and. Uh, if it works out, then we'll make something else together. And if it doesn't work out, then um, then uh, we won't. Or we'll, we won't for another five or ten years. And then maybe we'll find each other again. You know. <laughs> I mean, I 
I, uh, am I at the table? I guess I am. I guess this is the table. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I just had an experience where I, you know, I, uh, where I first day of rehearsal, a director uh, said, okay, great. We don't need you anymore. And I was like, oh, I, I, I just wrote a play. It's a brand new play. And, uh, I haven't said a single thing and I'm already not in the in the room. I'm not already I'm already not in the room where it's happening and it's my play. <laughs> um so that was a that was a new one for me. Uh I think the way I've gotten in the room is to make sure that it's my room. Um not that I own the rehearsal room further, <laughs> but but that it uh, that I'm also a producer. That I'm also uh, um, I I play I do multiple things. I'm also so oftentimes I act in my own work, so they can't kick me out of the room. Um, uh, so that's one of the ways that I've I've done it. And then the other thing is just like just the theater will ask you to ask for permission to be creative. Um, over and over and over and over again, the clubs or the streets or um, buses or anywhere else you might want to put on a play because people put them on all over the place, you know, in bakeries and and phone booths. And, you know, I mean, they put them on all over. If you go to Edinburgh, there's a play in every single space in the entire city uh, during the festival. And you can, you don't have to ask permission. You can just do it. and that is thrilling, um, especially as a young person. So I, I would just go to the clubs where they would let anyone do it. You know, um, I show up, you show up dressed up in some fabulous outfit, you stand up on the bar and you do something interesting and they're like, oh, will you come back next week? And we'll pay you a hundred bucks. Like that's how I, I got a career is basically just by not asking for permission and just doing it. So that's what I would recommend. And eventually, you get enough people around you that you realize, well, this is some really good advice I got um, by a Hollywood person years ago. He said, you have to go to the party. And what do you manage? You have to show up. You know, you have to show up. You have to go to the party. But you don't have to hang out with the people that you don't like. Hang out with the people that you like. And then in 10 years, 15 years, you'll discover that all the people that you like are now in charge. And, uh, right, so you don't have to network. You don't have to try to um, get, I don't know, Oscar Ustis to have a conversation with you and, and to um, throw his graces on you. You just, like, hang out with the people you like. And then one day, you know, like, <laughs> Nigel Smith, my, my co-director on 24 Decade, will be the artistic director of the public theater. You know what I mean? Or somebody, you know, now he's the artistic director of the Flea and he's doing my play at the Flea. So that's just, I've seen that happen. And um, all the people that I liked who were nobody in the theater are now like Rachel Chavkin just won the Tony and Rachel Haug just won the Tony. And, you know, they're just all the people that are are working. Heidi Schreck and they're all the people I've worked with over the years and young Jean Lee. And I mean, so um, that's the way to do it. Hang out with the people that are your around you. Don't try to, you know, don't try to get in into anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't hear that question at all. I was like thinking about something. I was like, oh. Rachel just had her baby. And I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hope Rachel's baby is really happy in the future. I hope there's a planet for her. What's my hope for the um, LGBT? I don't know if she wanted that to be public news. Sorry. Ha, sorry. Um, uh, what did I... Uh, what do I want for the future of the LGBT community? Um... I hope we take over all the alphabet. Um, I always made fun of a Lugabutsquia community, is what I call it. But uh, but I um, but there's also a part of me that's like, yeah, we need a 
W. And we need a, you know, we need all of them. All those letters. Give it to us all. Make everybody be like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, G, U, Z, W, X, Y, Z community. Every time. You know what I mean? That would be amazing. Uh, not shorter, longer. Uh, so that's what I hope. Um, not less more. Uh, I hope I hope that we can get away from the infantilization of America. Uh, I, 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 I long for um, uh, more critical thinking. And I don't mean opinions. I think there's a plague of opinions, uh, which is an opinion itself. Uh, but I, I, I would really like uh, us to get away from um, feeling like we, uh, our status will raise in the community by what we like and dislike and by what we shut down and what we encourage. Um, I would like us to get away from that. I would like us to just uh, consider and celebrate considering and celebrate people who are um, digging deep and inspiring us to uh, go deep into our considerations. Um, that's That would be my hope so that, you know, I like a comic book movie ever so often, but does that does it have to be the biggest? I mean, you know, the the great authors uh, used to be celebrities, and now who's the biggest celebrity? Donald Trump, you know. So, um, so I I would like to change that, and I think that's, uh, and I would like that I would like queer people to get a little away from um, uh, identity politics, if I'm honest. Um, I don't, I, I think that identity is the reference for contextualization, but not the point. And um, that's, I'm not sure if that I'm, I'm totally on board with that. As I say, I, I, I don't know if, all I know is I don't know, but um, that's something I'm thinking about a lot is, uh, is, is identity um, is focusing on, like everyone wants to be seen all the time. And I think people in the LGBT community were starved of not seeing themselves growing up. They want to be seen. And But I tend to, I see myself every day, not just because I'm semi-famous now, but because I walk th by windows every day and I see my reflection every day. Every morning I see my reflection in the mirror and I think I have to see myself even in the culture. I can't just like, you know, just like see myself when I see myself, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm curious about this desire to always have everything reflected back at us that is us. And, and how can we inspire more curiosity instead of um, uh, more uh, um, political action as identity, uh, which maybe sometimes feels like just a lot of self-indulgent people trying to um, um, be seen and heard. <laughs> I understand the reasons why, but I, I still, I still, I question it. I don't know. It's what I'm really uh, grappling with right now. Oh, I said you guys were in Rhode Island. I'm sorry. I was in Rhode Island earlier. I know it's Massachusetts. <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we call it, I got the punitzer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Change your hair color ever so often. <laughs> I mean, really, I think it's that simple, right? You know, like, just, like, um, put on something you wouldn't normally wear.
walk down the street in that. Uh, whatever you're wearing is the drag is the story you're telling the world. So right now you're all wearing. Um, we're going to a lecture talk and uh, uh, drag, right? And um, and okay, fine. You know you're wearing. We we don't mind wearing these corporate clothes drag, and that's fine. Like I that okay. But also, what's the other story you could be telling? There's a possibility for a storytelling and art making every time you leave the house, and um, uh, that's I think a, a way to participate uh, in, in that in that community and um, and. I also think it's just like encouraging people to break outside the social etiquette and the the norms and stuff and um and to to challenge yourself to do it. I prefer to live by example rather than tell people what to do. So, you know, I just try to to try to do it myself and I have to hide sometimes uh, often um just so I can have the energy. I have friends who live their life as art and they walk every time they walk down the street they are art. And I'm really inspired by those people, but I, I psychologically, I know I have to hibernate, um, which means jeans and a t-shirt sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, well, uh, in terms of uh, early theater, the Egyptians, they would, um, their th early theater was more kind of like parades with stories that would happen, but there was like a, a moment where somebody would die in the storytelling. They would actually, while they were acting out somebody dying over here, they would kill somebody over here, like actually have a human sacrifice. And <laughs> so I was like, mm, that's kind of exciting. <laughs> So uh, I thought, how can I, how can I do that on a on a stage, but not actually kill somebody, but you know, use metaphorical death, but also, um, how can people sacrifice things that aren't useful to them right now? And and we, uh, one of the problems I think we have in the U.S. is that our um, uh, nostalgia is uh, make America great again uh, is. Um, stopping us from moving forward uh and uh, stopping the progression and and also so much of our country is built on pretty dysfunctional uh, uh, dysfunctional foundation um and so how and we've built our community based on things like um well there's a song in 24 decade uh called uh Cold Black Rose it's a sea shanty adaptation of the very first minstrel song so we don't do it. We're not doing it tomorrow night, but um, we do it in the big show. And um, it is the the community of sailors in the song are are singing the song to um, build their community to get the work done. And they're using the idea that if they get the sh uh, the the sail up and everything ready, they can go into town, and that their reward will be that they can gang rape a woman who is enslaved. That is the um, if you just listen to the song, it's like, yay, it's a sea shanty. When you really look at the lyric, that's what the lyric is saying. So the community is building itself based on this horrible thing. So I think as a country, we have to look at all of the little details of our lives, how we have built ourselves based on um, horrible thing. Nobody wants to give up, up community because community is pretty great. But if the community it, um, was created because of something as um, horrible as slavery and sexism and homophobia uh, um, and capitalism, too, uh, then we have to think about how we can um, build new foundations. So that's um, where the sacrifice comes in. Can we sacrifice some of these things we hold so dear that actually aren't useful to us?
Um, the research, well, Eric N., a very smart playwriting teacher and playwright, uh, uh, was teaching this silent, I was at a silent retreat with him, and he, he talks a little bit during it, but you're all silent for nine days, and he just, he gives you prompts, and you write, it's really uh, incredible, and during that, he, he said, uh, because part of the silent retreat is that we don't communicate at all um, with each other, so there's no like smiling and nodding, there's no opening a door for someone, and you know, or there's no saying thank you or anything like that. Uh, and there was also uh, no internet searching, you know, and so there was a the fear that we couldn't write our play if we weren't able to do research. And he said, you know, you have your play inside of you already. You don't need to do any research. Everything you know about it, you you already know. So uh, now I think you know that's the way to, that's the place to start write the play and then you can do the research um now that's there's no hard and fast rule for any of this you know you might uh, with 24 decade uh I, I would say you know i'd need to do a little research because i didn't know anything about history and part of the joy of making the project was that i wanted um to learn i had a really bad education uh public school education um and we just I, my history teacher was an alcoholic and I, you know like no, it was there was like 40 kids in the class and we couldn't learn anything um plus i was getting beat up and weren't you know i couldn't focus then so um i what i what the great thing about theater is you can say if i want to learn something i make a show about it and then i can learn about it so um, I would say, okay, um, we're working on the 1920s uh, decade right now. Let me just read something briefly about what was going on in the 20s, see if something grabs me. And then I would say, okay, great. The um, content dictates the form. So um, uh, it's just after uh, World War I, um, 16 and a half million people, I think, died. Uh, clearly, there's going to be some um, trauma happening. And then they call it the gay you know the gay 20s or whatever you know like <laughs> and so or not the gay night it's the gay 1890s and the whatever the 20s was called so you know so you're you're thinking why are they why are they all so happy because the war's over but i think somebody's not telling the truth here so then we make the entire 20s about um that everyone's trying to force their fun on you because they're traumatized so that's something that comes from me and my idea about the history. I'm not a historian or a musicologist, you know, but I, I do think we have all this history on our backs. What are we going to do with it? That's what we're trying to figure out in the show. And so, um, and that kind of relates more to this present moment where every, you know, everyone's like, yay, yay, we're having a good time, we're having a good time. And everyone's trying to force their good time on you. Look at me on my Instagram, I'm having a great life, I'm living life, living life, you know? And meanwhile, you're like, well, maybe you might not be living life. Um, you know, <laughs> they're like, living life, living life, living life. Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, so I don't know, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm touring the world, I'm at these fabulous places being an influencer, you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't think that's living, but um, that's my, that, uh, that's my opinion again. Uh, so that's my long way of saying everything and nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taylor, we're really, really grateful for your time <laughs> today, and we are really, really excited to have you performing here at Holy Cross tomorrow, so could you please... Join me in thanking Judy for being here today.